which is on public participation and conflict resolution and environmental decision making processes. Um, I'm very excited as all uh, other colleagues uh, of mine in this course we were following um, yeah almost um, all previous lectures you had and the courses so um, together we built up a course which goes quite hand in hand with the previous courses and and the lectures and assignments you you did uh, we are concluding with this course uh, Mm, a long road together, which, uh, yeah, have brought a lot of information, uh, discussions. So I hope, I really hope that with this one, you will really put the cherry on on the on the cake. So during the fifth course, uh, what we will do today um, uh, is the first lecture, but before I start the first lecture, I will do a short presentation of the course and who will be giving it. Very short one, and then uh, soon after I will start with the lecture. After the lecture, we'll have some questions and discussions. Some of the students started some questions even before the lecture, which I was happy to uh, to look at it. But then uh, by the end of today's lecture, I will also present the assignment that you'll have for, for this week. So said that, the first course is built up on providing you with some information how the community and the civil society engagement can be, can be organized and done within the environmental movement. And then we'll see how this movement has evolved, um, how the processes, the developing processes has supported the movement, but also are presenting some of the challenges uh, to it, not only currently, but even in the previous years. We'll be talking about some fundamental um, instruments for the environmental civil society, among which Aarhus Convention takes a special place that gives to not only environmental NGOs, but to communities a strong, a powerful tool to, to receive information and also to participate. So this is, um, this is one of the areas that uh, has evolved recently, um, which uh, nurtures the community engagements with commun community engagement and also uh, develops the the rights, the human rights, into another uh, layer and another perspective. And we will conclude um, the course with the conflict resolution and management procedures. Sometimes a part of the many tools we have and the engagement, still there is a social conflict uh, that we would need to address. Will be four lectures on the cons consecutive uh, weeks, starting from today until June 4th. The first one will be with uh, me today, Environmental Movement Evolution, the Dilemma for Conservation versus Development. And then the second week will be on the legal uh, Aarhus and EU horizontal legislation with Sir John Ronchevich and Assistant Professor Alexandra Tubic. The third week will be on proactive community on engaging for environment and a energy cause with Anna Lobrak. And the final week will be on conflict resolution, principles for successful collaboration and justified limitations of the collaboration with Ermelinda Mahmoudai. We'll have, uh, we'll have an assignment, uh, one assignment for the whole um, course in four segments uh, you will pick up a cause a flagship cause uh, with one ngo or coalition for each team and then step by step week by week uh, you will be developing the elements of of this assignment starting from today uh, with environmental elements after each lecture, each week, we'll present specific details of the assignment. Usually, it will 
continue to be the same style and typology of assignments as as we uh, as you developed basically in the previous courses. So the the today lecture uh, will be discussing elements of the environmental movement evolution, which is I have to say um, uh, it's a movement which has evolved, but mainly recently. While um, looking at it from the perspective of human knowledge and wise, um, people were aware on environmental challenges and problems and elements and factors, everything. Not recently, but probably 2000 uh, years ago. But we are talking about a movement which is a recent phenomena of, I would say, the modern human society. Um, and this is the first pillar of the lecture today, uh, which I have linked to the dilemma of conservation versus development, which is an element that sticks to the environmental discussion frequently. We would hear now and then Mm, people saying, should we conserve like the museum, our nation, our nature, or we need to develop it? So we'll discuss about those elements because those are um, those are organ organically built into the environment uh, into the environmental movement. Those extremes, I would say, we'll find uh, yeah, on different organizations. So before I start with the lecture, I choose to present a bit myself on pictures. I'm teaching ecology. Soon after finishing the fifth course, I will be with my students as last year, the pictures you, you see here on the field with them, visiting some nature uh, areas and talking about ecosystems. I also teach environmental education with uh, teachers to be on chemistry and biology. Um, I've been a climate leader um, since 2013, trained by Al Gore. Uh, so, yeah, I do lectures on climate change and discussions and media appearances. We'll mentioning some of important steps into the environmental movement, such as Aarhus, Aarhus in Denmark, 19, uh, 1998 was the place where Aarhus Convention was signed. I was there, I recall uh, those days. And then uh, we'll also mention uh, frequently in the lecture today, but also in other lectures, Rio, Rio Summit of 1992, but I've been on Rio plus 10, 2012, um, and several other important climate, uh, climate uh, gathering. To observe that the, that element of globalization and that element of movement, it's now beyond borders. I've been part of uh, the environmental movement in Albania and in the region since 1993. Um, we'll be talking later in the in the lecture about the Fridays for Future movement and. Um, yeah, I also took part on some of the youth gatherings. Of course, I was not the youngest among them, but still uh, felt that I should be part of, of that one to, yeah, to support with, uh, although I was feeling, I was feeling like responsive, responsible for what, what they were asking for, um, as my generation was causing part of the climate change. Uh, then, um, as being an environmentalist, um, yeah, I like to do uh, media, civil society uh, communication. So, following your previous courses, um, yeah, I felt quite close to the lectures you had, how to address media, the messages. I do quite a lot of them. Uh, and now I also lead the Resource Environmental Center Albania, which is um, an environmental organization since 1994 in the country. 
And as I have put here a T-shirt, I believe all good biologists have, are born on, on October, but I know uh, there are 12 of such T-shirts each for each month. So this is, uh, in short, my, my presentation. Then what I will be going through the lecture today uh, is uh, a list of bullets like here. I will be talking a bit on, on the NGO work to understand the third sector. Some of you might have experiences working in the sector, know about that. Some others might have here, uh, might have, yeah, some information. Um, and some would like to contribute probably in the future. Then I will talk about on the history point of view, how how the NGOs came to the picture, to the landscape of the society, how their uprise came mostly after crisis and after wars for the role um, they uh, played. And then a bit on the structure and on the establishment, because this is one of the areas that gives them strength, strength, but makes them also vulnerable. Then we'll talk about the waves of environmentalism, the four waves, um, and then we'll include on those waves the environmental NGOs. The environmental NGOs didn't come from the very early days of the environmentalism. But when they come, they become very strong players of the global environmental discourse. So we'll be discussing a bit on the environmental discourse because NGOs, as other actors of the society, are part of this debate occurring, um, occurring at all levels nowadays. Then I will be talking a bit from knowledge to action, because this is an area, environment, in, in, environmentalism is an area where the knowledge is built up so fast and has changed the way how we are addressing issues very drastically. Uh, I mean, upside down, we'll be talking about how the future will, will be looking like very soon. And then we'll be talking about turbulent times. Turbulent times are not only for the society, but the NGOs in general and environmental NGOs are facing some of the challenges nowadays that for some of them, I mean, those are very strong challenges that, that put them in a crossroad. And some of them, I mean, it's a, like an an an, an li lively animal. So they 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 are born, they are grew up. Sometimes they feel the mission, and and disappear. So to start with the first uh, understanding, what is this uh, word of the civil society uh, named NGO, which frequently we we consider it or others consider it as a third sector uh, aligned with the government businesses and the non-for-profit and the media is the fourth one the first use the first ever use of the term non-governmental organization is used by the united nations after the second world war 1945 when the UN as an intergovernmental organization wanted to be more open to groups, society, etc., so they, uh, they invited other agencies, which were not governmental one, and gave them not the vote, but just observer status. And in order to identify them, the non-governmental organization term was born and used. But later on, the definition from the UN came as an NGO is a private organization that is independent by any governmental administration, as long as it is not for profit, not criminal, not political. So basically, if you are not one of those three, basically you fall into the category of non-governmental organization. But different uh, institutions and agencies to have other definitions, for example, the word bank includes trade unions. Some do not, but some do. 
uh, the World Trade Organization includes chan chambers of commerce. I mean, they also fall into the, the very generic uh, definition of non-governmental organization. Altogether, with or without trade unions and chambers of commerce, all are key actors for the society, which are not directly linked with the ad governmental administration or the businesses. Sometimes they do present business interests, but they are uh, representative, they are channel. And therefore, they play a good role into the development of the society, human rights, humanitarian aid, environment, public action, etc. There is a big debate uh, now and then. Uh, is non-governmental a good term, a good specification? Because it, if you say non-governmental, you might put the everything else which is non-governmental. You might put even media or business, which is not which is not the case. So. Some countries have moved away for, from the non-governmental term, and they prefer to use more non-for-profit organization. Non-for-profit is a smaller group of the NGOs, which is basically closer to the real definition of, of the civil society, civil society groups. Recently, no, they're not recently, but basically in the last 10 years or even more, uh, CSOs are, uh, it's another term that it's even closer to to the role of the, civil, uh, of the um, NGOs in the country. The diversity is really big, really, really big. There are efforts to cluster them, but hardly do better than cluster them by geographical area where they do operate, like national, local, regional, uh, or international. Or the second cluster is what do they do, like environmental, social, human rights, uh, gender organization, etc. But apparently all of them are formed by the goodwill of a group of people to do some good for the community. So. Basically, the non-governmental or organizations are groups of people that, that share the same vision and mission, the same, they should share the same vision and mission, the same contribution to a community. So this is um, the glue that brings, that should bring together some citizens some individuals and form a group. Um, and in some cases, we understand that those groups are not registered even, they are called grassroots, grassroots groups, or sometimes they are registered uh, to the courts or whatever countries have assigned to do that registration, and they form a legal uh, body, which is an NGO. So the diversity, it's it's very big, but all of them are non-for-profit, so they do not sell. Sometimes they do have some economic activity, but countries have definitions what is allowed, what is not allowed. But basically, they do not sell, so they should have some funding source from um, from other organizations, from donations of individuals, from corporations, from um, from governments in order to function or organize activities. Many people also expect that volunteerism is a uh, built value within the organizations because they are formed to provide to the community. And that's a, de a debate on this, how much the volunteerism can uh, make uh, an NGO survive. So, um, the NGOs are organized on, on country level, but there are some at the international level and and country legal framework this, um, uh, forms or structures the NGOs. So they are named by the legal uh, framework and they are structured as each country legal framework requires requires to. So uh, the 
two pillars what the NGOs are doing is deliver services to people in need. And this was the very traditional, the, the very start of NGOs started from that. We'll see some, some history, uh, history facts uh, later on. But in this case, they do uh, distribute aid, development projects, etc. And most of the other activities where also the environmental NGOs fall is advocacy cluster, which is raising awareness, campaigns, research, and in this case, NGOs aim to transform the society, to transform the communities for good and improve their well-being, etc. So basically, all those groups that do fall under dem democracy building, conflict resolution, cultural preservation, environmental activism are into that category of clustering. Some interesting facts for you which I also uh, collected uh, for, for, for this lecture. The biggest, the biggest world NGO by money, it's Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which is an endowment of almost 29 billion US dollars um, coming from their own corporate. Uh, and then we'll see some of the biggest um, NGOs which is, for example, Care International, their budget is for uh, 420 million US dollars, out of which 70% comes from, from the government. And Medicine Sans Frontier, for example, from different governments, they do get almost half of the budget. But there are organizations that are strictly uh, not accepting money from the government, like Amnesty International, uh, Helsinki Committee, for example, that, that's in our countries, Greenpeace, um, do not get money from corporates. This is purely for maintaining their independence and, and yeah, legitimating their, their actions. But there are some other organizations that are purely on membership uh, fees or corporate fees, like, like those organizations that do uh, fight for interests of certain certain business category, for example, where also chambers of commerce, commerce are. So diversity regarding money, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, quite, uh, quite big. If we see how the NGO, uh, the NGO movement uh, developed, it's part of the nature, the human nature to assist, to support people in need. I picked up a few examples, like the first written elements of, of communities getting organized into groups, associations, is in China for supporting um, communities along rivers. And it is linked to natural resource uh, share. But later on, some 400 years, uh, later on, in, in Netherlands, uh, there, there is record of an association for recovery of the droned people. When a boat was, was sink somewhere, they started to bring back those droned uh, sailors home. So they established a, an organization which later on got distributed in different countries of the world until the 19th century. So that organization almost lived for 150 50 years. Around the same period of 18th century in United States, um, those human rights organizations started to, uh, to build up. And the, it, it, it is one of the organizations like Pennsylvania Society for Relief of Free Negros unlawfully held on bondage. So for supporting the black people um, uh, into their effort, uh, um, yeah, to, to fight the, the slavery. And this remained until very late. This, this is one of the organizations that, um, that uh, flourish many other non-anti-slavery -slave, organizations that were until early 20th century, part of, uh, of the 
rights of minorities there. So those are on the early uh, groups, which were sort of organized communities to support uh, to support people uh, people in need. But there is another interesting case from a Swiss philanthropist, Henry Dunant, who established in 1855 the first uh, big network of organizations, and it was named World Alliance of Young Men's Christian Associations. The first group that went beyond the country uh, borders, and after having a personal experience in a bloodshed in Solferino in 1859, he established the Red Cross that we know today. So at the time, this philanthropist wanted to support people that were wounded in, in the battle. But later on, after the two wars, the uh, World War I, the first one, uh, Save the Children and, and the International Red Cross now got established. So after, uh, after those communities uh, went out of, of the war, the poverty and the support was needed. So those big organizations started to build up. Similar developments occurred after the Second World War. But I was picking up one big element that the United Nations acknowledged the value of communities uh, into involving them for writing, drafting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, which gave them power and started to uh, uh, yeah, empower them in the, in the future. So um, I would summarize uh, that there were those crises, mainly at the society, economic and environmental ones, that somehow made the communities get together and develop um, the community network, feeling, etc., to protect each other, to protect the community interests. Later on, we'll, we'll talk about the trust the lost trust to the government and services provided by them, that somehow it was an alternative of the communities to survive, to face the challenges. So many of the NGOs be, uh, developed or got established on 1970s, and there were few important conferences like the Stockholm Conference on, on Human Environment, the first conference talking about urbanization and, and pollution problems, etc. And another one about the gender in Mexico that somehow fueled many NGOs to get established and start talking and articulate their, their needs. But then uh, back 1990s, after um, globalization, after the um, Eastern Europe, got into the democracy area, the NGOs started to uprise more, and there was 1992, the Rio summit, with the fourth, four UN conventions that made uh, a leap for the, uh, the environmental NGOs. So the growing of the NGO sector, the third sector, came after 1990, uh, 1990, where not only as a number, but also as a financial support channel to that sector increased. For It, it is a, a World Bank estimation that it is five times more financial means channeled through that sector, capillarizing the funds to the society uh, after the 1990s. So uh, this was sort of evolve, evolvement of, uh, of the NGO sector. But there is another interesting story, the unions. Unions seems to be as an organizing 
um, alternative of workers, employees for um, yeah, defending their rights or interests. And the, the, the photos here are of few days ago in France against the pension reform. The unions are the ones that are gathering thousands and thousands of French people in the, in the streets of Paris and different cities in France. If we compare unions and NGOs, they are both coming out of two main big processes. One is industrialization and unions try to appear uh, early on the 20th century and globalization, which is more the wave of NGOs. Many of them do have similarities, but there are also different, di big differences. Big differences on the way how unions do see the organization and for what interests they fight versus NGOs. For example, unions protect workers' rights, and this is very targeted. And everybody knows that uh, a healthy union association uh, it's really fighting for the rights of unions. So, so to say, very targeted. If we see the environmental NGOs or NGOs in general, they do provide services, they protect values of environment. For many people, this is perceived as a very broad base. And I'm sitting here, not that I believe, but I, I wanted to bring a case here uh, the example of conservation versus development, and the, the, there is a big difference on the way how unions and NGOs perceive both ways. So I, I tweeted one union leader that I found in an article saying that the NGO movement might be a great force for change, but it cannot say what the change should be. And this is about the call case now. The call case, stop the call, it's, it's such a strong case in many countries. Like, I'm not talking about uh, the Western Balkans where the call is used for electricity uh, generation, but, but in Poland and United States, in Australia, where coal, coal mining, it's a big industry and many communities depend on that on that uh, uh, on that industry for employment uh, and generating incomes. So that's very interesting story to see how both of them evolved and what tools each of them each of them use. So talking a bit on the NGO structure, um, I I would say that today human society. It's living on a globalized, um, glo globalized area where the technology collect, connect people and people feel close to each other, sharing experiences, sharing stories, sharing problems. That has made the story of the NGOs become brighter and more in the focus of the other pillars of the society. Because now you can come closer to government, you can come closer to people through the, mm, yeah, through the communication and technology. But today there is also crisis that push people to find alternatives, as I said before, People, many people have lo lost faith on governmental structure, on the quality of the services we receive, on the uh, responsiveness of the government, on the transparency of the government. Frequently, we also feel that decisions are not in line with the community interest or environmental interest. So that's why people get together uh, to Mm, yeah, to to find an alternative for governing uh, their life, their community. The way how they come together brings some some names. For example, 
Uh, you might have heard some of them. Some of them are new. We have Bingo. Bingo are called big in international NGOs, which are those organizations that I said before, millions of US dollars or euros uh, budget per year and covering big regions, if not globally, uh, like the Red Cross, for example. We have also international governmental organizations. Those, those might be even regional, like European one, or might be global ones linked to UN or not. So those are, for example, like Oxfam. Uh, basically, uh, those co cover bigger, uh, bigger uh, regions. And then we have environmental NGOs. NG, e NGOs or Ringo, religious NGOs. We have civil society groups. We have Gongo. Gongo are governmental organized organizations, for example, organi organizations that are mm, um, brought together by government. They don't, do not have only government, they do have also um, other actors, uh, which might be individuals, research, etc. And we have also Mongo. We have Mongo organizations, uh, uh, Mongo organizations. We have also Longo, uh, local organizations. But Mongo is a term frequently we, with a negative connotation with NGOs that are formed by one person who shows himself everywhere. So if we see this is part of the big diversity that we are, uh, we are facing. So it depends what an NGO uh, in a country means, but most of the NGOs do have uh, uh, do have uh, yeah the the vision, the mission. They have a statute, they have a name, they have some activities. They have a group of funding members. It depends on the country how many they might be as a minimum. They should have some finances. They should have a legal form. It depends country by country. If they are a membership based organization, usually they are called associations. If they are a foundation, usually they do have uh, some funding and they do manage that funding. They might be center, center in some countries to have a meaning of no membership, uh, but mainly a know how. So it depends on the country how they are named. They should have offices, and some of them they have also legal uh, and tax registration. Depends on the country. Sometimes they are in different offices, like court, etc. And I also brought here uh, brought here some interesting facts about the NGOs. If the NGOs all together uh, will be a country, it will be by the economy the eighth in the row of countries with one trillion US dollar. Uh, yeah, gross domestic product, if I may put like that, uh, uh, budget. Altogether, there is an estimation of 19 million workers uh, and, uh, and three of four NGOs are also led by women. This is uh, frequently referred uh, yeah, promoting women or NGO uh, NGO work has a stereotype that uh, stereotype that uh, it's more for for women sometimes. It's the wrong one. Some countries, for example, India does have a huge number of NGOs in one NGO for each for Indians there. But in Europe, there are 130 uh, 30 um, thousand NGOs, so a big a big number. Uh, EU. Coming closer to our region, I see some of the comments. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about Balkan, uh, Balkan NGOs uh, soon. Um, NGOs are also uh, mm, NGOs are very important actors uh, for the EU, and they do have uh, a special program. And they also have developed an enabling uh, environment document. Um, which uh, each country on Western Balkans is monitored how uh, the country institutions do support uh, NGOs work. 
um, and it's called enabling environment for the civil society uh, civil society organizations so it's one of the criteria that our countries should fulfill in the road towards uh, towards eu i'll be talking a bit on the waves of environmentalism which goes a little bit beyond but it somehow paves the way where the civil society organizations uh civil society organizations uh, are uh, developed. The first wave was the early environmental response, which was late uh, 800 to early 900s. The driving forces, its nature destruction, both from industrial revolution, but also um, people that were uh, emigrants, for example, in US and Canada, but in Europe, it was mainly industrial revolution that put people into some understanding and consciousness that the nature has been destroyed. Nature would uh, be affected by that uh, industrial revolution. Like we have some early, uh, early documented books in, in UK about the acid rain and the pollution there. So the in the first in the first uh, wave of uh, environmentalism, it was aimed to protect the nature as it was. So try to stop the further destruction of it. Until 1960s to uh, 1980s, where the second wave of the real environmentalism came. If you, if you recall, uh, on the 70s, a big wave of pollution, pollution of all environmental components, air, water, soil, was a big problem. Uh, the first legal acts uh, appeared on, on that period, uh, both in, in Europe and the US. In US, around 1940, uh, 1974, the air act but uh, in britain it was a bit earlier so basically uh, that element of pollution as well as the resource crisis the oil crisis on early 1970s brought the consciousness of people that the pollution might affect people we recall that in early 1970s, the first pesticides were banned, like DTT, Lindan, etc., because it was understood they were cancerous. So this area where the pollution came to focus and the big development um, exploded into more industry, more exploitation, brought more the first big environmental NGOs. This is the time where Greenpeace and some other big NGOs got, uh, got uh, established. The third wave comes on 18, uh, 1980 to late 1990. So before this, um, this century uh, would start. And in the third wave of environmentalism, the big boom of the NGOs, we'll see the figures coming soon, the big boom of uh, NGOs, environmental NGOs uh, got established, were formed, they started to operate, they started to articulate the voice, and it came mainly from the global environmental problems, the depletion of ozone layer, uh, but by late uh, 1980, made a big, a big issue everywhere globally. I do recall this was a time when, when, um, when people were really afraid of what's going on, even more than the climate change now, at a short period. But then climate change came, and then sustainable uh, development concept came with the Brutland Report on 1970 uh, 1987 in Germany. So there were areas of big uh, environmental sort of revolution which brought together global environmental efforts 
the ozone depletion convention came only on in three years. So it was such a short time. We didn't manage to do that for the climate change. Many NGOs got together to Rio. Aarhus Convention was uh, signed 1998. So the third wave was a real boom, a real peak into the environmental movement around the globe. And of course, the Eastern Europe um, started the democracy era where many NGOs started to also uh, form. And now we came to the fourth wave, which is the wave after the 2000. And we'll be talking again about that in the, in the coming slides. And it is the wave of activism and the youth movement. Again, global environmental problems beyond borders, but mainly climate change now and the resource depletion, globalization of values in a positive term. So people are feeling, uh, people are feeling not, not according to nations, but according to the planet. So this came as a wave where we discuss more on environmental rights and very recently environmental rights coming with Arcus Convention, but even recently now with the UN declaration last year, environmental rights comes as human rights. Global networks are established. So the fourth wave of environmentalism is on, on the way. Here is, it is a, an article, a scientific article of 2020, so a recent one, basically, which shows the establishment of NGOs, environmental NGOs, uh, around the globe. And we can also see, uh, see Europe. And those goes in line with the waves, with the third wave. And after the third wave, now on the fourth one, number uh, again drop a bit but the third wave was the wave of ngo establishment this is the article you might might read it further some of the uh, some of the graphs i have included in the presentation now but what i found interesting uh, out of a sample of big organizations i would say of 650 environmental ngos 34 of them were in europe they found that an average NGO, environmental NGO, would have 19 staff. And this would vary from very small NGOs, one to two people, up to 17,000 members. And budget also vary a lot from small NGOs with 14,000 US dollars per year up to others that might have millions of euros. So this is also, um, this also shows, the article shows a lot uh, the differences on different continents and how it is evolved. Of course, Europe keeps a special uh, place both in the number of NGOs, but also how strong, strong they are. So I'll be talking a bit now uh, 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 I'll be talking uh, a bit on the global environmental discourse. Uh, and as by definition, a discourse is a shared way of apprehending the world, comprising on system of ideas, definitions and values, the structures, the understanding and the action. So basically what we do consider as a norm, as a definition, and then made us sort of talk on that. The four environmental discourses uh, now might be different clusters, but those four were agreed on, on the scientific uh, papers are environmental management, which deals with pollution and with all the elements of habitat destruction, etc. Climate politics, which involves the climate, emissions, etc. Energy efficiency, renewables, etc. Environmental justice which is um, linked to what we'll be talking about, Arcus Convention, access to resources, etc., and ecological modernization. Ecological modernization does um, 
goes for uh, innovation, technology, etc. So if we will see how NGOs are positioned themselves on those environmental discourses, this is again a very broad pictures, a very broad picture where many NGOs try to work both at the local national level by doing piloting things. Others might work at the national level, international level, doing politics. So, in general, for environmental NGOs, I would say they manage through the environmental discourse at the national or international level, they manage to bring what is local to a national and global perspective. And what is coming, what, what is part of the biophysical, the physical environment, to the policies and governance. So they bring from bottom up the cases and they bring the environmental components to legislation, strategies, and the governance. So this is uh, a two direction work of uh, of the NGOs. Part of this uh, part of this uh, research is uh, also an assessment of their mission. And if we see their mission, how much uh, those organizations uh, do uh, repeat or have certain key words. If we have single words on the key missions, we see the development environmental, sustainable, the ones that are more into the focus. While when we have a combination of two words, it's sustainable development, climate change, natural resources, as well as human rights you would see here. So those are the typology of actions, usually um, many of NGOs uh, uh, state they would work on um, this is another interesting graph which shows how the NGOs are positions, what, what positioned. Uh, so what do they do, basically? And this is a distribution from this article of 2020, where, as you see, many of the environmental NGOs are found to be positioning into the climate politics and environmental justice. So basically on the, on the rights category or into climate and ecological modernization, which is the, 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 C, uh, the C area, the C plot here. Less on management and modernization. Of course, this requires a lot of money, requires research, and less into justice and management, which is an area that will merge with the uh, with the uh, pollution from climate and and justice. So those are the white dots, while while the red dots are how much influential or what areas in what areas NGOs are influential and influential now trying to influence the politics and the power. So this article shows that most of the NGOs are trying to influence mainly on environmental justice and climate, climate politics, which is interesting. Probably those refer to challenges that the, the society is, is also facing now. Now coming to the Balkans, how I do see the environmental discourses in, in Balkans out of the four. I picked up two different big campaigns, I would say no call campaign, in most of the countries of the uh, Western Balkans, which somehow is linked to climate politics and environmental modernization as part of the discourse, if we are if we are looking at it. And yeah, a big group of coalitions, individual NGOs at the national level are really fighting to, to change the course of fossil fuel use for electricity production and yeah, get rid of coal use. Well, there is another one 
a big campaign to save the Blue Heart of Europe, which, to, uh, which uh, means to save the rivers from dams. Uh, and this is a campaign which is mainly on environmental management and environmental justice. So those are the two discourses that uh, fall into different areas, common in Balkans and more frequent among the uh, debate and, and actions of, of the NGOs. Um, in all countries, you would find coalitions of NGOs, international NGOs and national NGOs and local communities coming together for both campaigns, start bringing it to a higher level of, of uh, country, country debate. I do see a very important uh, element into the environmental NGO, the move from knowledge to knowledge to action. And considering that the, for the environmental NGOs, the science, the science data and the communication tools has been the two main pillars of the modern environmentalisms and environmental NGOs. If environmental NGOs will sit on a table with different actors, they would use frequently science data from the pollution, science data from the impact on biodiversity, science data from the loss of habitats. And we'll communicate that on various tools, but those two elements have been the major allies to the environmental NGOs recently, which is good because uh, because dr drives them out of the pure emotions and and um, perceptions. Apart of the fact that frequently the science data are quite criticized when the NGOs are doing research themselves, etc., by the other actors, but this is an angle that we might further further discuss. This started back on 1962 with the Silent Spring of Russell Carson, um, which was a book that, that for the first time talked about a uh, spring without the birds songs and without butterflies flying. Because of the pollution, those species would disappear and, and the spring will be silent. This was the first, first ever uh, book that built up a movement out of it. And I was really honored to have these limits of growth given to me by the author of it, uh, Dennis Meadows, which which was a book that um, for the first time, and it, it, it appears every 10 years they do revisit the book, um, brings an uh, element of science into the NGO debate. So out of those books and many others coming from the research, the NGOs made two major victories, the environmental NGOs, two major victories, and purely because they had better knowledge than before. First, they managed to put the precautionary principle versus the prevention principle. Until science was on its own kingdom and not really joining forces with environmental NGOs, it was the prevention principle. I will build an, a facility here and I will try to prevent the pollution. Now, I'm not allowed to build uh, an industry if it might have a risk for the community. So driving from prevention to precautionary, try to change the whole mindset of the decision makers and support, protect the communities and nature. The second victory of the environmental NGOs, due to knowledge, I see, I see the shift of the burden from the, uh, as a proof, from the one who might cause the damage to the one that potentially might have a damaging activity. So 
you tell to the institutions and that you as an investor tell the institutions and communities that there is no risk to environment, no risk to community when you are applying for the environmental permit, not after building it, which was the case until 60s with the chemical industry. So the environmental NGOs managed to shift the story upside down, and in that case, they prevented both uh, risk for nature and, and communities. Rachel Carson, who died very soon after her book was published on 1962, wrote those two interesting paragraphs. For the first time in the history of the world, every human being is now subjected to contact with dangerous chemicals. Simple words in a new reality. And she also wrote, it is a wholesome and necessary thing for us to turn again to the earth and in the contemplation of her beauties to know the sense of wonder and humility. So those were words that somehow developed that big movement in the society back on 1970s. So now let's look how uh, the NGOs are developing their actions and, and, and yeah, their actions. I'll turn them, try to turn them to models. Sometimes they are becoming models for some NGOs, but not for some others. If you see how Greenpeace is activating people, is, is making a case, they are extreme. They got tied by chain to big chimneys. They invade uh, a boat, etc., and then use media to communicate a very strong message, like in this case, Greenpeace was doing with Shell in, in, in the United Kingdom, clean up your mess, Shell. So this is basically uh, not really conventional. And sometimes in the beginning, this was also obstructing activity, extreme obstructing activity, mainly to draw attention to to keep extreme actions that might risk even the life of those activists in order to become a media hit. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it hit back. And there were cases when um, such stories were also hitting back um, the organizations that were doing these type of actions. So sometimes there are models, but sometimes this um, this is not considered uh, as a, as a, as a good strategy. Other strategies are public education, media campaign, lobbying, and as an example, I'm bringing here Al Gore Climate Reality Project. Al Gore, after he was uh, yeah candidate for president of the United States and didn't won. He became one of the outspoken voices, figures for climate change. And, and he, he is doing that in various campaigns, um, even, um, even media appearances and movies and documentaries like the Unconvenient Truth documentary. While there are others like local small NGOs at the national level, local level, they are doing simple, but very useful actions to raise awareness on different activities at the community level, like recycling, green consumerism, establishing alternative communities like the energy cooperatives, energy communities nowadays they are talking, so to, to increase the independence from the system on, on, generating, on generating electricity. So different actions might serve models if the NGOs manage to to bring the message to get the critical mass of individuals on board. And here is the dilemma of growth versus nature. I met this guy 
whose name is Dennis Meadows, one of the brightest minds that made me also, uh, yeah, think differently. He wrote his book, Limits of Growth, together with late uh, wife of his and another colleague, three of them, where he writes, there is no such a scenario of continuous growth without limitation harshly affecting the growth and well-being. The linear economy is adjusting rapidly the resources. He said that on late 70s, early 80s. And yeah, he's one of the, uh, the minds that flagged the climate change. It's a big problem in early 80s. I found him a bit pessimistic nowadays. He said the train left for sustainable development back on 90s. He also said to me that he's trying to be independent of the systems. Then I asked him, but I mean, people cannot live individually. But he said, yeah, the role is of groups to do it, to raise still the consciousness. So as a public discourse now, the ecological modernization comes strongly into the, the, into the debate. We are yeah, we are hearing more and more of the circular economy. We are hearing more and more in the crisis of the energy nowadays, how much the situation has changed in a matter of few years, just for a oil crisis, energy crisis. Many countries decided not to have any more diesel cars after 2030, 2035, etc. So the ecological modernization, now it's the new area which people would see as a solution that the dilemma growth versus nature should not be either growth or nature. They can sort of build up together. But th this needs a total behavioral shift at individual and society level. It's very easy to, to say, difficult to do, but we are forced to do it. And the NGO, NGO role into this new era we are living, it's indispensable. The years to come will be totally different from what we lived so far. Definitely, you see how fast the electric cars are getting into the market. Scooters around with uh, the young generator. Many, many, many small actions are popping up nowadays. The price of the solar panels, it's down. The energy, uh, renewable energy now is getting more share into the market. Do we need to do it? Are we aware to do it? Of course, the graph you see on the right side shows that if we go, as we are now, business as usual, back on 2050, we might need almost three planets. We have only one. And this, this, the, this is, the photo is uh, quite original. Um, this is my real cup. I, I have it uh, close to me. Uh, and I have drank with that thousands of times. Saving the whole pile of plastic thing. And usually I say, yeah, you, you need to change the way how you think. And then, then there is a way out. The biggest, the biggest uh, blocking factor is in our, in our mind. As far as we are pushed to find a solution, we probably will go with the comfort zone, which is not anymore here. Now again on the fourth wave of the environmentalism. You know the Greta Thunberg, who protested in front of her parliament in Sweden, and he left the school in August and then for three weeks and media catch that, and then she became a famous person. Many people 
got also criticism on her. I mean, you would hear many things, but usually I ask my students, why Greta Thunberg became a global phenomena? Became such a phenomena, the worldwide Fridays for Future movement put many youth people out of the schools in the streets requesting faster, stronger activity. So why it's happening? Usually people would, would see Greta as the phenomena, but I, I say to my students, Greta, it's, it was a condensation point of the anger the the yeah many questions that the youth are having that when she managed to articulate on her own way everybody got empowered articulating then together it might not have been greta might have been somebody else it was a moment of consciousness unfortunately not at the whole society but among the youth. So this is the fourth wave of environmentalisms with or without NGOs, people will get to the streets. So NGOs, it's good to be part of that movement and they are, but people will go, will go to the street, people will install panel, uh, solar panels and that's the role, that's the role um of the of the civil society so what we do observe now as an effort common effort of the civil society is join forces among different actors and beyond borders that's the new trend nowadays when you have the internet you basically are together as we are now from the whole region in a in a single in a single event and the ngos now, besides the fact that might not have thousands of people home, they are thousands group around Europe or even broader that fight for the same cause. And that can be interpreted as, as a same um, way of thinking, a global thinking that, that would really bring different uh, structures, different elements, different units to uh, to the table of debate and and discussion. And again, probably you have mentioned it before. Viosa River was Viosa River and some other rivers in Balkans, but Viosa became hit as uh, it was mentioned. Yeah, from famous people around the globe, from various. Uh, um, activists around uh, the capitals of uh, of Europe until the government of Albania decided to declare it a national park. So it was a success, I do really believe, because of the joint forces in Balkans and in Europe at all levels, civil society, politicians that managed to achieve what what it was, um, um, yeah, the goal. And we are living on turbulent times. I was reading some uh, of the chats, of course, in, in Balkans, we, we do have a lot of criticism to the civil society and I'll be talking that. But yeah, we do bear in mind that um, the time we are living, it's also um, special, It's it's not, calm and peaceful, which makes the life of environmental NGOs very much uh, challenging and, yeah, not easy one. Many groups that are fighting for the rights of their communities because of the hydropowers are built without uh, asking them, without their, let's say, uh, participation, the community participation, are called by police. Those are real pictures that I was collecting from around where, where NGOs, communities are blocked by 
by the state authorities because they are asking their environmental rights. So basically, we are facing uh, an, yeah, quite a pressure as, as individuals and as groups, also by the state authorities. Many of the governments in Europe, I would say, but also in Balkans are becoming authoritarian. Democracy does have many flaws, and that makes the NGO movement difficult. One of the European parliamentarians that were visiting my country and, and we had a talk, he asked me, are you afraid as an environmentalist? And I said, no. Before, if I would say something, somebody would make a call and say, why did you say that, Miha? But now I'm facing a a very strange situation. I might say whatever I want, nobody cares. And that's even more problematic because you are knocking in a, in a yeah, deaf door. So that's very critical for the civil society to bring up a case and not to forget the global crisis including pandemics, including the war in Ukraine, including the energy crisis, the economic crisis with the prices going up. All those things are on the shoulders of the communities organizing activities because then Maslow comes into yeah, effect. They wouldn't talk anymore on environment if they don't have a job they might migrate somewhere else. So basically the turbulent times affects the uh, action and, and, and the work of the civil society. Many people are criticizing the civil society and I'm aware of that. I don't want to paint it pinky and rosa because I know the story how it is. Many NGOs are at the crossroad now. What to do? Some of them are over institutionalizing themselves. What does it mean? Getting too close, kissing with the government. And, and of course, if you are too close with the government, when it comes to do a, an advocacy, then probably you might not have the power of criticizing. Over institutionalization is also requested by donors. They do, they do give to NGOs, uh, uh, they do give uh, to NGOs a small amount of funds and then the bureaucracy out of, um, uh, yeah, justifying how this uh, funds is spent with all those papers, etc. It's not on the nature of the NGOs. So this over institutionalization is losing the original spirit of the NGO, NGO work, the community action. There is another trend which I see uh, a problem. Global issues, global movement get the most of the intention. If you talk to climate change, of course, it's a big problem. But many small communities are of a few tens of people, hundreds of people somewhere really being in problem with a certain natural resource, with the pollution. But because it's too small, probably it's not a good case, not a good campaign case. So frequently NGOs that are at the local level are facing a dilemma how to move ahead. If they keep going the local uh, advocacy campaign, probably they will slowly be demotivated because they might not have the important achievements they should have. And then again, it's coming back a discussion about reform or radicalism. This was back on 1970s, but this dilemma is coming back because the states 
many states are quite authoritarian and they are doing public participation as a checkbox, but not a real public participation case. So many NGOs are thinking, should I do play the radical role and protest and burn some flags or make some, I don't know, big noise in the media or work for the reform? Should I be the populist one, gather people, talk on the, on the words that people would come after me versus play the expertise role? Many people would like to play the expertise role, but the expertise costs. And then, should we resist or cooperate? So those dilemmas are continue to be with the environmental, environmental movement. And those are pressures that slowly are uh, keeping the environmental uh, movement at certain level of um, yeah, restriction, so they cannot really flourish totally what they are able to do. And there are other problems related to, uh, to the inner elements of the environmental structure. For example, for a governmental institution, you do have state audits, you do have some mechanisms that control the spending. I know the corruption is everywhere. I know that they are not working, but, but on paper, there are some institutions that do control. But one of the criticisms that is coming for the civil society is how the transparency and accountability works. Frequently, many NGOs are closed. Not really, you, you go to a website of an NGO, you don't really find the, what are the donors, how much money do, do they have per year. I don't need to have their small budgets and their salaries, but at least a minimum information on the activities they are having, how many activities they are organized, etc. It's not there. So this, this damage the trust towards communities. Again, funding is another element which makes NGOs quite vulnerable. For example, should we or we do not get money from the government? If we get money from the government, you don't really do good advocacy. Or corporates. If we get money from a corporate, does somebody say they are greenwashing with us? So those are elements that the funding makes them vulnerable. And then there are also other moral and non-realistic expectations. NGOs are caught in, a, and this is a quote from an article, NGOs are caught in webs of compromise, pulled by great expectation from one side, and then the requirements and, uh, of respectab uh, respectability from the other side. So they would like to provide more and be more respected, but then they cannot provide that much and then they lose into their visibility. So those elements make the NGO sector uh, also vulnerable. Still, if I would compare the pros and cons, the weaknesses and, and strength, the, the NGO sector and the environmental NGO sector among the bigger um, third sector, it's a value of the society. People get together, people uh, invest into into their beliefs in a society, the things that they cannot do into the other pillars of each of our societies. To conclude in, in last two minutes, the civil society will continue to have a vital role in maintaining the pressure from, for green policies and accountability, and also bring new technologies, adaptation, also act as a watchdog. So this role of the civil society will be with us as, as much as we do have that system in place. But that needs some support, needs some support for long-term resources, the civil society to get engaged, to raise awareness, to share information, to have public uh, participation, exchange of, so the whole role get 
uh, implemented uh, only through having resources in place. Ensure that civil society and activists play an active role into the environmental policy processes. Frequently, we have fake participatory processes. You will discuss that uh, in the next, next uh, lectures. So if we do have meaningful uh, participation processes, society can really contribute. We need further research to understand, to understand not only the environmental processes, but also civil society processes, how they are engaged into the national and regional level. We need to exchange and learn more from what might be working in one country, might not be that uh, feasible in another one, but many approaches we are, uh, we are not, we should really get from others and not invent the wheel again. Finally, intensify the public awareness. Public awareness is the key that fuels is the motor for the civil society is the if the public support NGOs if the public does support civic initiatives the civil society does have a stronger voice and will make them real partners uh, with uh, with the government or other actors of of the society those I found uh, from an environmental activism in the Western Balkans. Uh, uh, a publication that you have the you have the link here, and you might have some more information out of it if if it's needed because do have some cases from each of our our countries. So this was the lecture for the first lecture. Of course, it's um, quite a, um, yeah quite a broad topic and also diverse. Uh, looking from different perspectives and and um, yeah, very dynamic, I would say. I'll be looking at the chat if I do have some questions here, but otherwise you might uh, continue writing it. We should be aware of balkanized NGOs that actually operate as profit centers. Of course, there are some of them. Usually they say that uh, they lose trust after a while. Yeah, sometimes they go for quite long, but at the very end, each NGO should, um, yeah, should uh, fulfill the mission and vision and, and um, present the interests of a community or uh, a cause. So um, there are efforts in, in Balkan countries to have a code of ethics for the civil society organizations where um, yeah, NGOs are part of this club, I would say, showing that the code of ethics is followed. So there are efforts to, um, mm, yeah, to leave aside those uh, elements that uh, we know, and it's not only in, in, in Balkans, I would say, might be also other, uh, other areas. Um, Yeah, sometimes balkanized is a negative connotation, but I wouldn't really find it uh, very much as such into into different uh, networks, uh, European networks where, where uh, I am participating. Sometimes being from Balkans, you might also bring a perspective, important perspective from the region, uh, from the culture and, and specifics that our region does have. So. I would put in a positive trend rather than um, with a negative connotation. And I'm not really worried that, that some, some elements of that, um, yeah, not following the ethics of, of a civil society would really damage um, everybody else, uh, everybody else's image. Yeah. Yeah, several people have, have talked of balkanized, uh, but I would, yeah, I would say there are many positive, much more positive uh, NGOs and, and uh, um, cases that we can refer to and we can build upon. 
at the very end, when you will build a network of people, you will choose the good ones rather than the bad ones. Uh, so, yeah, not to really generalize because it wouldn't help uh, the cause. Um, Will flights and planes ever be in focus as huge air polluters and gas emitters? Of course, um, of course, there are a lot of uh, um, both from the business point of view, but I'm not here to talk about them. But uh, a lot of environmental organizations now after the COVID are limiting flights and planes and, and just to, to ban that one. But that's a big, big business. Um, that would, they are also talking about reducing emissions. So it's an element that, uh, yeah, we should fight to uh, to address together. Greta is using trends, of course. Um, yeah. Okay, that's. Uh, Somebody really like the kissing was about the word, of course, getting too close, it means that you lose some of your uh, identity. Okay, as there are no more questions, I will go very short in, in the last uh, minute um, uh, about the assignment. The assignment is, is very simple, I would say, and also interesting, leaving very much space for you to develop it. Um, as, as you would think, but consider that this will be the first segment in the long uh, four weeks. So uh, try to identify an environmental situation which does have uh, an impact on a society. Try to be a uh, sort of broad where there is a need for public participation and conflict resolution. Uh, so you will identify now the, the case, the environmental situation. You will tell in, in 1000 words, what are the driving forces that makes that situation specific and why you are flagging it? So if we are 10 years from today, will we recall that case again? And if, if the answer is yes, because it was important and many people and, and so much impact it was for the nature and people, then pick it up. So choose one, uh, one case and one NGO that was, uh, or network, that was somehow leading that cause and identify two milestones of actions that happened in the past where public was engaged or not engaged that will lead you then to the second segment where you will be talking about public participation story. So this is for this year, uh, for this week, sorry. Um, and I hope that, um, yeah, by the end of, of the week, as per deadline, uh, you will be uh, having the discussion and also put down the 1000 word describing the situation, the NGO and the milestones. I'll be supporting you during the week in case there is any question um, come up, feel free to choose whatever might be not really uh, standard a uh, case that we have heard a lot, but it should not be a very small one in order to have enough information to fill in the story in the coming weeks. I was happy to be with you this afternoon, and I hope that this afternoon, uh, at least uh, in addition to the lecture, bring, bring some, some uh, facts and discussion with you. Thank you very much and have a nice uh, nice evening. Keep in touch during the week. Bye-bye.